呃，大家好，那很欢迎大家来到今天第二场呃第二天的议程。那当然在议程开始前，我还是要跟大家来呃正式非常隆重的来介绍我们的 Keynote， 因为这场 Keynote 是我们非常难得邀请到呃就 Google 的呃 c a r l Smith 来帮我们分享他的研究。那 c a r l Smith 在之前在非常著名的呃 Project Zero 是 Google 非常著名的一个漏洞挖掘的研究团队呃当做当过 Intern。那之后，他加入了 VBus 呃 Engine 的 Security Team， 所以从这边可以知道说他是这呃这个世界顶尖的这个呃漏洞挖掘研究的人员。那呃我们这场议程呃也是我们看到了呃在国外 Offensive Com 之后，我们觉得这个议程非常的经典，所以特地去邀请他啊、呃、过来参与。那也很。高兴的 c o s m i t h 非常好的，哎，答应了我们的这个邀请。对，那今天议程会介绍呃 JavaScript Engine 的 Fuzzing。对，那在这边大家应该每天都会用到网页，那 JavaScript 就里面非常重要的一个元素，而 JavaScript 的 Engine 又是漏洞非常多的一个项目，所以我们怎么样去 f a s t JavaScript Engine 找到漏洞，让它变得更好，是一个非常重要的一个议题。所以在这边，呃，我们。呃，而而且它的工具是有 open source 的，所以跟昨天一样，我们希望说，我们在这场 talk 讲的东西，大家回去就可以把它抓下来，真的动手玩玩看。好，那呃，我这里就呃不多说，那接下来呃，就让我们掌声欢迎呃 c a r l Smith 为我们带来今天呃精彩的议程。Thank you. Thank you. 你好 ，Hello everyone. Thank you for being here. Also, a big thank you to all of the organizers and the volunteers for making this、um, such an amazing event. And、um, it's my first time in, in Taiwan, and I'm having a great time so far.、Um, so thank you for all of your hospitality, and、uh, the, yeah, everything is so nice.、Um, so my name is Carl. I'm at the I'm a security engineer on the V8 security team at Google. I'm based in in Switzerland, and.、Um, Today, I want to talk about fuzzing, specifically JavaScript engine fuzzing. I think JavaScript engine fuzzing is such an interesting topic, and、um, we're having some interesting problems、um, within fuzzing. And、um, fuzzing is very important to our work. So we built some cool things over the last like 12 months or so. And、um, I just briefly want to talk about some of the couple of things that we actually、um, did. And the alternative title to this talk is "Finding Cool Bugs with Little Compute." And I hope that. By the end of this talk, you will feel inspired to actually also go out on your own and actually fuzz V8, and hopefully you will find some cool bugs, and hopefully I will see you in a bug report or something. So let's quickly、um, do a quick refresher on fuzzing. What is actually fuzzing, right? So imagine we have this program here on the left, and this is the the equivalent control flow graph, and. We might want to find the bot call right behind those two if statements. So for us as a human, it's quite easy to tell, right, that we need to enter 42 and then 43 to actually get to the bot call.、Um, for fuzzing, if we actually test the program with random inputs, how do we give the fuzzer a sense of progress here? And、um, in this case, we use the control flow graph, and we basically try to cover as many edges in this graph as we can. So we maximize the edge coverage in the graph. And in this case, if we actually fuzz and we create an input that has the the, the first input A, which is 42, we will discover the first edge,、um, the first green edge, right, that goes towards the bot call. And this is progress for the fuzzer. So we actually we've seen a new edge, and we add that to our collection of interesting inputs that maximize this edge coverage in this control flow graph. And hopefully, then we can take this input from the corpus that we have created. And、um, mutate the second input to hopefully eventually get to the bot call at the end, which then is a goal. This might be a bug or another interesting program state yet that you、um, want to explore. So, for JavaScript engine fuzzings, our inputs aren't just numbers. These are like full JavaScript programs that、um, you know can be like a complete program that is fairly complicated. So we use Fuzzily for that, which is、um, a custom fuzzer that uses an intermediate language. We call it FuzzIL.、Um, th this intermediate language was developed specifically for JavaScript fuzz fuzzing. It basically represents a JavaScript program, but it has been developed so that it can be easily mutated and translated to JavaScript. This is an example of such、um, such a program in this intermediate language. You can see we define a function. 
We can create arrays, load ints, we can call methods, and um, we can also call the function at the end. So the cool thing is that we can actually mutate this program quite easily, right? JavaScript would be not so easy to mutate, so we mutate this IL. In this case, we can change inputs, we can change constants, um, we can insert instructions, and um, this is just very nice. The, I think the most interesting mutation that we are currently doing of our basic mutations is, so -called, um, this is the so-called splice mutation. In this case, we might know that um, we, we have like two programs in our corpus, and uh, we might want to copy the, the return instruction into the, into the first program, right? So how do we actually do this? Well, we know in this intermediate language that the before variable depends on the result of the call method um, instruction, right? And we can see that this uses v2 and v3. So we now know that these are all dependencies of um, the v4 instruction. So when we actually copy the, v4, the return v4 instruction into the first program, um, we have to take all of the instructions um, above it, pretty much, that are marked in green, and copy them over too. And the cool thing is also that in this IL, we have a, um, a concept of contexts. So in this case, we know that the return instruction is only valid inside of a function or a method. So in this case, um, we can only insert it into a function definition or a method definition. Um, this is what it would look like once we actually insert it. We also have to rename some of the variables. And you can see that we also renamed v1 to v23, which is the argument of the other function. And um, we think that um, splicing is probably the best mutation that we currently do. And I hope that by the end of the talk, you will understand why this is such an important mutation. So, but we're not, this is not the end yet, right? We still have to translate this into JavaScript. We call this lifting. And this is like a very, like, we have some, some optimizations, but this is pretty much a one, this you can like one-to-one -one map our intermediate language to JavaScript, right? Here we also do some inlining where we um, do some other stuff, but uh, this, is, this is very simple, actually. And this is what we then feed into V8, and we then observe the behavior in V8. So this is pretty cool, right? We can create JavaScript, we can mutate it, we can combine samples from our corpus, and this definitely finds bugs. It has found a lot of bugs for Zili over the lifetime of Fuzili. But unfortunately, we think this is not enough, right? We still have bugs in, in V8 and in Chrome, so, so what is the problem, actually? Well, if we think about the space of all possible JavaScript programs, right? Like, where is our fuzzer actually, where is Fuzili actually um, working in? Like, what are the programs that Fuzili is generating? This is every possible JavaScript program you can imagine, so this is fairly large. So Fuzili probably samples a very small subset in this space. This is not to scale, and every fuzzing run will be somewhat, somewhat, somewhat different. And this is the space of the programs that actually increase this metric of code coverage with the control flow graph that I mentioned earlier. And um, by minimal, I mean that we also have some minimization that reduces every program to basically the parts that were like, interesting or why it was interesting and why we kept it around. So this is the space that Fuzili also generates, right? The, the yellow part was the, the, the corpus, but the green part is what is generated. This is basically one mutation away, because we take a program out of the corpus, we mutate it, now we have a different uh, program. This is somewhat outside of the program that we had in the corpus, and um, this is the space that is generated, right? So it's slightly larger, um, but this is one mutation away. So we will have bugs that are one mutation away, those are the bugs that we find fairly quickly. Um, but we will also have some bugs that are further away, right? And now the question is, well, can we actually do something about this, right? Like, what is the, how can we get to those bugs that are further away from the space that Fuzili currently finds? And we have multiple options here, right? Um, one of them is trying to import existing JavaScript code for mutation that is somewhat close to the bug or like that explores somewhat some, some other parts of the engine that has some more complexity. And um, this is possible. We have a compiler that basically takes JavaScript and brings it back down to the IL because that's what we can import into Fuzili. And that works. Um, 
but again, it's like very limited, right? Because we can only import test cases that um, that we know of. Like maybe we can like try to find variants, um, but yeah, that is one option. The other option that I think is like um, very interesting, probably the most promising, is using a different feedback mechanism, right? This is, I think, probably a future research topic. We have some ideas of how this could be achieved, and um, nothing, that, nothing concrete yet that we, that we think we, we, we can share yet, but um, this is something we're exploring actively and thinking about. Um, if you have any ideas, then please feel free to find me after this talk, and um, yeah, we can chat about this. So um, this would probably change the way that the, the, the corpus that is created, right? The yellow circle wouldn't be where it is right now, it would be maybe somewhere completely different. Um, Another option is that maybe we can use some specialized, more sophisticated mutators, right? Something that hints the fuzzer towards known bug patterns or um, more complex states. So for that, I first want to talk about a somewhat old bug in JavaScript engines. This is a very, very classic JavaScript engine bug. Um, we create an array. This is also fairly old, right? We create an array. We, we fill the array with some values. Then we have this object that is called evil. It has a callback um, for the value of um, method, and it basically sets the, the length of the array to zero, right? So it removes the, the, the backing store of the array. And uh, we then return 10. So what now happens is if we call slice, which basically takes a subset of the array, um, it has to convert the upper bound, right? Because the slice is usually from like one to five. But in this case, we pass this evil object into the slice function. So we actually have to convert the value to this object, and we basically um, call into the value of callback. And in this case, we remove the backing store, we shrink the array, and the slice operation wasn't aware that the array basically changed uh, underneath it, right? So in this case, the slice operation was just happily doing its thing, even though the array was already gone. And in this case, this led to an out-of-bounds access, as you can see in the bottom, we have some, some random data in there. And this is a very classic um, vulnerability in JavaScript engines where you didn't anticipate the side effect of the value of callback. So what is important to note here is that Fuzili will find all of these different things, right? Fuzili will find the value of callback. Fuzili will find the shrinking of the array. And Fuzili will find the slice operation all through regular code coverage, because they all have a specific edge in this control flow graph, right? Um, the really important thing to note is, though, that Fuzili is not rewarded for combining them in a meaningful way on the same array, right? So now the question is, like, can we maybe you know, help the fuzzer out? To illustrate this a bit more, let's imagine that Fuzili has these three samples in its corpus, right? So we have the first sample, which, which creates the array, fills it with some values, and then it also has an evil object that just returns 10 in its value of callback. Fairly simple. The second sample in the corpus has an array, and it sets the length to zero. It shrinks the array. And the, the third sample just called slice on an array, um, even with the, the, upper, the upper bound is out of bounds currently. So what would Fuzili actually have to do to find this, um, this trigger for this bug in 2016, right? So first of all, we would need to perform two splice operations, right? These are all in our corpus. We might choose the first sample, and then we would have to insert the shrinking into the call value of callback, and we would have to insert the slice operation at the end of the program. Those are both two operations where you have to choose the correct positions of where to insert these things. And then, if you actually notice that we, you know, we remember the, the dependent variables, we know that we have to depend on the different arrays, right? These all have the same name now, but in Fuzili, these are different variables. So we might just copy the arrays into the program, but um, they're not operating on the same array. So we're again not triggering the bug. So Fuzili also has to know that these things all share the same type, right? We're all operating on arrays. And in this case, we can then basically not copy the arrays from sample two and three, and just change the argument to the same array that we already have in the sample one. So in this case, the splicing of the two um, sample two and three, they both have to know that they share the same type and basically rewire these inputs um, to operate on the same data. But that is not everything, right? We then have to perform an, um, 
a so-called input mutation, where we basically change the input to the slice operation to this evil object. And after all of these steps, right, we then trigger this bug. So as you can see, Fuzili is quite smart. We can do this rewiring. We know the types. Um, we can do the splicing. But even so, Fuzili needs to perform quite some things because, you know, every sample triggered the specific edge. But again, combining is hard. So what can we do actually about this? And the thing that we came up with is the so-called probing mutator. And um, in this case, the question that we wanted to answer for fuzzing was, well, if we have this, this built-in function, this API in JavaScript, the question that we wanted to answer is, well, how is the, the v1, the input to this function, actually being used, right? And what we do for that is we basically install a probe in v1 in JavaScript. This is a temporary program that we feed into v8, and then we basically observe what it is doing. And the probe is really just translated into a JavaScript proxy object, and it records all property accesses and all method calls that are happening on the proxy object. And we then send that back into Fuzili, right? And Fuzili can then basically, you know, like know, oh, you know, value of is being accessed on this proxy in the built-in function. Maybe we should um, install a function on v1 and then pass this object into the built-in function because we have noticed that the built-in function accesses the, accesses the value of callback. And this probably triggers some interesting behavior, right? So we want to basically concrete this, uh, like, like convert this probe into a concrete operation and then pass it into the built-in function. This is the final program that we actually um, take into the corpus. The one with the probe is just temporary. It's, it's just to get some more information. So this is one of the mutations that is going to be super helpful. Um, this has actually also found a bug. Um, so in this case, we create an array buffer. It's a very, very similar bug, right? Um, and then we also have this callback, which resizes the array buffer. And when we trigger the two primitive conversion, very similar to the value of callback, it shrinks the array. And this leads, in this case, to a harmless out-of-bounds access um, because we were aware of these bug patterns. And um, like, the cool thing is that we notice the installation of the callback but we can also notice accesses to, for instance, the field of the, uh, the max byte length property of the, um, of the new array buffer call, right? So this is really cool. We can basically learn APIs while, while, we're, while we're actually fuzzing. So the second mutator that I want to talk about today is the exploration mutator. This answers a slightly different question. And now this question is, well, if we have a function, like this is a function that Fuzili generates, right? and we have this argument v3, we might want to know, well, what can we actually do with this object now that we have it, right? So in this case, we're using um, JavaScript's like runtime type introspection um, features to basically determine what is, what is a v3, what kind of object is it? Is it a number? Is it an object? Does it have properties? Does it have methods that we can call? And again, this is a temporary program with the exploration call, and we then might want to convert it into a concrete call to FUBA with the argument 42. And this is what the final program would then look like. So this has also found a pretty cool bug. And um, this is actually really interesting. Um, in this bug, we, we basically also create an array. And then we call the, the array add method, which basically gives you the elements you know, at a speci specified index. In this case, the index is quite large, right? So what happened here is that the optimizing compiler in V8 um, tried to optimize this array add call, and it had to make sure that when, when you call array add on an object, it has to be an array, right? It cannot be anything else, because that would probably go wrong. In this case, the, the check was not correct, and this led to a type confusion, because you could basically pass in a different kind of object, and um, you could then access elements out of bounds. This is really cool. Um, I also encourage you to actually look at the bug, because we wrote like, um, a really cool exploit for this. And this is something we are like, very sure that this mutation has found, because this array add method is actually quite new. And um, yes, it's quite new. 
So Fuzili didn't even have the add methods in its environment model of our array type. We didn't know that the add method existed because it was fairly new. So Fuzili probably inserted an explore operation onto the array type, and it figured out, hey, there's this add call that I don't know about, right? We should probably call it. And um, at that point, uh, we found this bug, which was, we were very happy to actually find this bug. So just a quick summary. Probe versus explore, right? So probe tries to infer arguments, right? So how do we interact with this JavaScript API? In this case, what do I actually need to make the new array buffer API work, right? We might figure out that we can pass it as Mike's max byte length property, right? Versus explore, which tries to infer return types of JavaScript APIs. What can I do with the result of this new array buffer, right? Like, what, what does the object actually allow us to do with it? And these two things are, I think, really cool, because it basically allows us to dynamically learn the environment that we're in. So if we now go back to our, like, our JavaScript program space, this is probably something we have done, right? We haven't increased the, the, the corpus, but we have definitely increased the area that we can cover with these specialized mutators, because they will definitely like, do some smarter mutations and increase this, this green area. Um, so that is, I think, really cool. So now... <laughs> There is still some, a lot of space on the left side, right? What if we have bugs there? And um, for this, like, if these bugs are like, somewhat far removed, right, like, we need to do some, some more um, heavy stuff, basically, to find these bugs, because they're like, very far away from what Fuzili will do, right? If you can imagine that we take a, a sample out of the corpus, we have to perform quite some operations to actually reach this point, and we have to get lucky to actually reach it in a way that actually triggers the bug. So in order to understand some of the more, more complicated bugs, let's take a look again at this bug with the array at call. If we do some very, very rough counting of the steps right, that Fuzili has to perform in order to trigger this bug, we could maybe say that you know, all of this takes roughly nine steps. right? And we think this is pretty much the limit of what Fuzili can find in a regular fuzzing run. Um, and this is already, I would say, a pretty high complexity, because you have to understand that at every of these steps, at every step, Fuzili has hundreds of options that it can choose from. It can call code, genera code generators, it can do mutations, it can do the splicing, right? And we have to get lucky in the right spots to basically um, to basically find the triggers. If we now actually look at one of the in-the-wild bugs that we have found last year, um, we've also written a root cause analysis document that you can take a look at. Um, it's not super important to understand what the sample does in detail, right? Um, we have some functions that, you know, that are doing some things. Uh, we call the garbage collector, and at the, at the, at the end, we have some, you know, some bad state. Um, in this case, it basically gets an object and the engine into specific states, and um, it then causes the optimizing compiler to again miscompile this set in a property function at the top, um, which leads to a lot of bad things. So if we do the counting again, you know, we might come up to this. Um, we might come up with this number of 14 steps, and as you can see, that is. That is definitely more complicated than, than what we've just seen. And now the question is, well, how can we actually make this more attractable for the fuzzer to actually find these things? And as a researcher, we might identify some of these things as, you know, like generic steps that you can do in a sample, or like as, as gadgets, pretty much, that you can use. So if we identify some of those parts, we might be able to come up um, with shortcuts that Fuzili can use to get into these specific states. In this case, um, we can, you know, we could maybe think of this operation, we call it, in this case, get object into interesting state um, with an object, and this is like a built-in. So we could program this into the engine and then let Fuzili know about this, but this sounds like quite a lot of work, right? But if you do the counting again, we, now we get to 10 steps, right? So this is maybe more doable for Fuzili. This is something that we might be able to find if we get lucky. So how do we actually find these bugs that are, like again, further removed from the screen part? 
we think that like human assisted fuzzing is definitely the step that um, you should go for. Basically, let the researcher use the, the domain knowledge that he has acquired, the intuition that he has acquired, to um, guide the fuzzer. And what we might know is that as a researcher, we have this rough, um, you know, intuition of the shape of this program of this in the wild bug. In this case, we might know, oh, we need to have like two functions. We need to call this get object into interesting state. Um, um, call and then we need to trigger the optimizing compiler what this loop is for so that we recognize that the code is hot So how do we actually express? This code shape to the fuzzer. How can we how can we tell the fuzzer? Oh, it might be interesting if you would fuzz code that looks similar to this, right? How do we actually do this? So in Fuzili we call these things basically program templates and for us It's like hybrid function hybrid fuzzing because we do a lot of generation, but also mutation so this is Swift code, but this is basically how we express these code shapes. We, we might be able to say, well, this f1 function should be a very like a, a regular plain JavaScript function with a random amount of parameters, and um, then we call this this build function. And this build function is super important to us. Um, that is because the build function basically lets Fuzili just go wild. It can mutate. It can generate. It, it basically can generate a lot of code. It can splice from programs from the corpus into this, this thing, and it can do a lot of different things. And the cool thing is that whenever we build, it does so um, iteratively, right? It knows that, oh, I just created an, an integer in JavaScript, so I can probably use it. Or I just um, you know, splice this part from the program, so the next build step can build up on what the build function has done so far. And then we could probably get, uh, call this get object into interesting state function, with some random arguments. And again, this random arguments call will pick up everything that we have generated inside of this program so far. It can then say, oh, let me pick this variable, or let me pick this object, and basically, you know, call the interesting, the ob get object into interesting state function. Then we can also build a, a simple loop that gets a random function, again, of any of the functions that we have defined in the sample so far. We can then generate, like, select some random arguments for calling this function, and we then just call the function with the arguments. Well, I'm actually missing the, the f there, but yeah, we, we can call that function with some random arguments to trigger the optimizing compiler. And this is like how you can roughly um, describe this shape um, to Fuzili to fuzz code of a specific yeah, shape. And this is the, the, the high-level logic flow of this hybrid engine, what we call it. We take this program template, we fill in all of the blanks, and um, we generate the program, fill, out, fill in all the blanks. We then further mutate the program with all of the mutators that we already have. This can also be explore and uh, probe. We then do that a couple of times and see if this yields new coverage or finds bugs in the specific code shape. And one thing that we actually did is we converted one of our internal fuzzers that was built in C++ and converted it into, one of the, one, uh, into a program template. Um, this is a reduced version of the template, but it's very close to what we actually used. You can basically say, again, let's build a plain function with zero parameters. Let's choose a pattern from either our interesting regular expressions that we have to find in, in our environment model, or just choose a random string, right? Then we also load this regular expression pattern with some random flags. We load a string, and we just call exec on it, right? And we then also call the build function uh, to generate seven more instructions inside of this function, and then we return the result of the exec call. And then we call it a couple of times. We do some more stuff at the bottom. We just say, Fuzili, hey, like, you can do whatever you want now. Hopefully, you, you'll find something interesting. And the cool thing here is we can be as abstract or as precise as we want to be, right? The top part is very precise, where we tell Fuzili pretty much exactly how the code is supposed to look like. But then we can loosen up further down, where we say, oh, just like do things that you want to do, right? With the, the code that you've already generated or the, the, the samples that you already have in your corpus. So I think this is pretty cool. And this has found a bug that has been in V8 for, for actually quite a long time. This is the, the sample that it has generated, right? And um, well, now the question is, well, we have just converted one of our internal fuzzers um, to this, this Fuzili template. Why didn't the internal fuzzer 
uh, find this. And we think that like Fuzili's flexibility and this build function really make a difference, right? Because we can further explore the state that we want to explore with this rough code shape. This is one of the two bugs that is actually found. And writing these templates is, you know, surprisingly easy. Um, it, you can do it within a couple of hours once you um, once you get once you've gotten familiar with a bit of Swift. And uh, if you take a look at the other templates. So another fuzzer that I want to show you today is the, the serializer API fuzzer. V8 has like a serialization API, which you can use to send JavaScript objects between processes. And in this case, we can see that we call the serialized method you know, on the serializer object with a random variable. Again, any variable that we have already defined in our sample. We can then mutate the content and call deserialize on it. And the deserialized object is then available for Fuzili for further mutation, further exploration, whatever it wants to do. And what's, I think, what I think is really cool in, with this example is we're basically fuzzing on multiple levels here. We're fuzzing the serialization API itself. We're also fuzzing V8's handling of the result of this deserialization call. We're doing like, various things on various levels here. And again, we have also found a bug with this template, right? And this is the bug that we found. We serialize um, a big int, you know, and then we mutate that, the, the, the resulting um, array that, that has resulted from the call. We then deserialize it, and then we actually, you know, do another operation on the result. And the last line is actually very important in triggering the bug, because the deserialization call um, resulted in an object that was in, a, in, a, in an inconsistent state, but the bug wouldn't manifest itself unless you actually touch this object in some way, right? So this build, this build call was very important to further explore the result of the deserialization call. So now, you know, if we, if we think about the space of programs that are generated by these, these mini fuzzers, you know, um, this, this, this space probably looks more like this, because we're, we're like more co like closely sampling a very like a tiny subset of programs. But the cool thing is that if you think about this, if you would just write build into the template, you would then sample a different space again. So you can basically change the size and shape of this green area in the top left to your liking and explore different APIs. Um, that V8 provides, or if you know that, hey, you know, like certain components in V8 have a lot of complexity, and um, you know we can trigger them in this way on that form, you could probably come up with a template that um, closely samples a specific area in V8. And so I think this is where we come back to the finding cool bugs with a little compute. Because if you think, hey, we probably cannot outfuzz Google, they have so many cores and so many compute and smart engineers, um, just think about this picture. Because the JavaScript search space is so large, we cannot possibly find everything. And if you know that you have a very specific idea of like, like where a bug could be in V8, I encourage you to, to basically write a template and then pretty much do some targeted fuzzing on these components. Because I think you can definitely find some really cool bugs and um, pretty much outfuzz Google. So what do I think is the future for, for JavaScript engine fuzzing? Well, as you've seen, combining samples with different features is super hard, right? Um, it's super important that we do the, the splicing operations. The different specialized mutators also help us a lot. Um, the hybrid engine is very cool, but at that point, we're very generative in a way. And cold coverage is very good at creating a diverse corpus of samples that trigger different edges, right? And now the question is, well, again, how do we combine them, right? Or how do we actually make use of these programs that we have? And I think that a new feedback mechanism, again, is the way to go. Maybe you would be able to understand that, um, you know, if you operate, if you, if you call, first call, the, if you do the resize call on the array first and then slice, that it is different than calling them in different samples, right? So if you actually do something based on data flow, I think you would, um, you would come to an interesting result. But again, it is very hard to design a good feedback mechanism, because if you're too fine-grained, every new program will be interesting, and everything you change will be interesting, because it is definitely a different program. So I think you want to hit the sweet spot in between being too fine-grained, where everything will be interesting, and you will keep everything around, but then, you know, like, 
your scheduling has to be like super, super smart so that you select the right programs to mutate and combine. Or if you're too, too coarse grains, um, the feedback will not capture enough detail, right? So I think maybe we, would, we, need, we need to look at something that is more fine-grained than what we have with code coverage with regards to like data flow, because that are, those are the problems that I'm currently seeing. Um, but again, you don't want to be um, yeah, too coarse-grained or too fine-grained. You have to hit the sweet spot, pretty much, I think. And um, yeah, I think the, a new feedback mechanism would be the way to go. Um, so just to summarize, I think the key takeaway here is that the JavaScript search space is, is large, right? And we are still having troubles finding like, very, very hard to fuzz bugs. But there are ways we can make this more doable. Um, and we think the templates are very good, specialized mutators are very good, but research and knowledge is essential at the end to understand where is complexity and where are the bugs. And coverage-guided fuzzing can only get you so far. Again, it will find bugs, but it will also struggle with a lot of the other bugs. Specific mutators like Explore and, uh, Explore and, and Probe um, are super cool. They can help us make these like, find specific bug patterns that we have seen in the wild. Um, and human-guided fuzzing is really, well, really good, right? We can use that to, to target specific areas um, fast code that is new or um, has been changed recently, and um, it's super easy to write these templates once you've gotten accustomed to um, Swift and uh, and some of the yeah our domain specific language. But it's it's doable. Yeah, and um, that brings me to the to the end of my presentation. I, I hope you thought this was interesting. Um, feel free to ask any questions. Um, you can also find me after the conference if you just want to say hi, if you want to know um, about my way into the security industry. Um, feel free to, to talk to me. Also, um, if you have any ideas or like questions, I'm happy to talk about compilers, JIT, JIT engines, um, and uh, yeah, browsers in general. That's all for today. Okay, I think we still have some time for some questions, so I think we can leave some questions for the audience uh, in here. Definitely. Yeah, so... <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, uh, first of all, thanks for the amazing talk. Uh, so I would like to ask about the, uh, it, the possibility uh, of using Fuzzily to fuzz the other components in Chrome, such as, you know, Mojo IPC or WebGL. Yeah, because uh, as far as I know, the Fuzzily is designed for fuzzing JavaScript engine. So I'm not sure if it is feasible to uh, fuzz like, you know, Mojo IPC or things like uh, WebGL. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that's a very good question. So we've done some experiments where we basically plugged Fuzzily into Chrome. And recently, this has been, we, we've been able to do this because of Chrome, Probe and Explore, because we can basically understand the APIs that the browser provides us, right? Which is like definitely larger than what we just see in plain V8. And um, I think you could try and fuzz those APIs and like Mojo, but I don't know if that makes a lot of sense, right? Because I think there are better ways to fuzz those targets, right? In this case, we're mainly focused on the renderer, right? So like how do you actually get the initial foothold in the browser? And then I think if you wanted to fuzz WebGL or Mojo, you would, uh, I think like other fuzzers would, um, you know, perform better. But I do think that you could use Fuzzily to find bugs in other browser APIs, right? Where you could, like, try and compromise the renderer much more. And we're definitely also looking into that. Um, but it's not as easy as just fuzzing V8. The browser is much more complicated and provides much more coverage, more edges, right? Yeah, good question. Thank you. Um, uh, one, can I? One more question. So I'll, I'll also like to ask, uh, uh, ask about the performance of the Fuzzily, uh, Fuzzily Fuzzer. Uh, so as far as I know, the Fuzzily is implemented in Swift language. Yeah, so uh, I would like to ask about uh, why do you pick Swift mm -hmm. and instead of Rust? You know, yeah. a lot of, lot of guys, you know, implement Fuzzer, Fuzzer and Rust to get yeah. uh, good performance. So yeah, I would like to, about, uh, I would like to ask about this. Yeah. Uh, also a very good question. Um, so initially, this fuzzer was written by Samuel Gross, right? And I think he just chose Swift because he liked the language. Um, I don't know if I would have made the same choice, but I do like Swift. Um, and what we observe is that V8 is 
such a complicated target, right? And you're going to be slow no matter what, I think, what language you use. I think if you write this fuzzer in Rust, it wouldn't change much, right? Because V8 is just so slow. We actually try and track um, how much time we spend in Swift. And it's it's fairly low compared. To, it's not it's not not something we worry about, right? We don't worry about the the time we spend in in Swift, but we worry about the time we spend in V8. And if you do, you know, if you compile code, it just takes some time. So again, we're not worrying about the performance of the Swift code so like that much. We do worry about it, but not it's not a main concern. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, nice question. And uh, anyone have a question? Want to? Oh. Hello. Wait, wait. Hello. Uh, since your uh, presentation, I, I want to ask a question. Uh, how do you implement the triage stage in your faster? Uh, wh what stage? Uh, triage. T R I A G E. Uh, I'm not sure what you. How do you mean? Oh. Maybe we can introduce more about uh, why you say your triage state is. Oh, triage. Yeah. Uh, triage. Um, uh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> um, so we do have some, um, yeah, some basic deduplication based on the edges that we hit in the control flow graph. graph. Um, but also, since this is V8, we don't expect a lot of crashes, right? So triage also hasn't been a huge issue for us. We do find if we, you know, if we fuzz on the latest commits and some engineers push some code that is very buggy. Uh, we do get, um, you know, we do find a lot of crashes, but we also automatically upload most of them to Clusterfuzz, which handles a lot of the um, deduplication based on stack traces and uh, other things. Yeah. Thanks. Hi, Carl. Thank you so much for the talk. Um, you know, the first thing sometimes you get low luck, right? And you have a lot of cores, a lot of resources in Google, but if you run s several times when you think you can't get any crashes, it's quite frustrating. Yep. When can we end the frustration? What kind of indicators that means we need to restart the pressure or we can do some more to improve the pressing to reach other space? Yeah. So that's also a very good Thank question. Um, I do think that you should look at, at coverage as a proxy, but not only that. Because um, also what's, what's happening if you look at um, this one sample here, I think one effect that we're having with these different samples is that once you discover the edge of, for instance, the, the resizing of the array in sample two, right, the array A is pretty much um, locked into this state. So whenever we combine this sample, right, we have to rely on splicing to change the, the array type or we will always copy the array with one, two, three, right? So we have this mapping of data flow to um, edges that once Fuzili generates this code, it associates the data with the edge, and this is what's going to be in the corpus until you, know, until you throw it out and maybe... But you will never rediscover this edge, right? So if you restart the fuzzer, you might see that this array now is, you know, like doesn't only have integers, but it might have doubles or objects. But the slice operation will look the same to Fuzili. It will trigger the same edges, right? Eventually, it will trigger some, some, other, hand, like some other functions, but um, yeah, maybe not through the slice call. Uh, one more follow-up question. I want to see whether I can fine-tune the number of edges and probability between you calling the samples between interleaving the functions. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I don't know. I mean, you can probably try to instrument the splice operation to get some more insights into what is actually happening during splicing, because again, I think that is where like the interesting parts are happening. Um, but yeah, I mean, we are also just restarting our fuzzers and letting them start from scratch to build up a new fresh corpus with, you know, we basically, we are sure that Fuzili will find the same edges within every run. But um, again, exploring them with different states and different data is, I think, key. And we're not modeling, modeling that with any feedback right now. So we're basically, Fuzili will find, I think, most edges in V8. And now we're basically only fuzzing the association of data with these edges. I think that's what we're doing. It does. Almost blind in a way. Yeah. Oh, okay. Hey, that way. Hello. Uh, thanks for your talk. Uh, I want to ask that uh, how do you evaluate the fuzzer you modified or the technique you added to? 
um, since the fuzzing process is a random pro yes. process and quite time consuming, yeah. and maybe there's a chance you modify it to make the fuzzer more effective, but uh, you don't have the luck to trigger the bug. And like um, uh, the cluster fuzz in Google runs on tens of thousand machines to fuzz programs. But we are not Google, so we cannot use that much resources, and the, the bug may yep. not be triggered. So yep. what do you do in this situation? Yes, that is also, again, a good question. I think it's uh, fuzzer evaluation has been hard in general. I don't think that like looking just at coverage is good enough, again, because different runs of Fuzili has shown that you will find different bugs, even though you, you didn't change a lot, right? In this case, we just think you got lucky, right? Um, it's hard, I think, fuzzer evaluation. And uh, I think a lot of it comes down to intuition and um, experience also um, of what definitely works and what doesn't work. I'm, I'm also thinking that like keeping it somewhat simple is good. Don't try to over-engineer a lot of the things. Um, um, yeah, I mean, we what we do is we definitely, if we find an in the wild bug and we're like, hey, we probably could have found this, we could have probably found this with fuzzing, we try to write one of these templates for it, right? And, um, and then we, we let it run on, the, on our workstation. Sometimes it finds something, sometimes it doesn't. Um, but if it doesn't find the bug, I'm not sure if that's, like, a, like you said, a good signal, right? Again, because it is a random process. And I think until we've come up with something where we can measure the, the difference um, better than regular code coverage, because we're at the limits of that right now, I think, with Fuzili most of the time. We do have some things that we don't cover, but I think we cover a, 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 a good bit of, of V8. Um, until we come up with something where we can measure the, these these things, I think it's going to be, yeah, like uh, a lot of intuition and testing. Sorry that I don't have a great answer to that. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think for this question, maybe no one has a great answer here. Yeah. I wish. I think it's an open question in the fast. Yeah, definitely. Fathers. If you have ideas. Anyway, yeah, but however, it's a good question. Yeah, yeah, and maybe you you, you can discuss more after the uh, this talk and discussion with speaker. Okay, so. Uh, does anyone has other question? I think it's a great chance to ask question here. <coughs> oh, uh,大家还有没有什么问题？那呃，如果大家有问题或比较害羞，呃，那也可以在Slido上面做提问。好，OK，Yeah，Because okay. we also have an online question uh, yeah. platform, so yeah, but currently not. No. Okay, cool. Yeah, <laughs> maybe pe people like to direct to uh, directly ask you. Yeah, feel okay. free to come to me, and um, yeah, I hope that you got some intuition of why JavaScript fuzzing is interesting and hard, um, and uh, hopefully you also feel inspired to write some of the templates or explore this data a bit more because I think there's definitely some more work that that um, people can do. Okay, 好，大家还有没有什么问题想要请教？如果有我没有看到的，也可以请旁边的人帮忙讲一下。Okay. Okay. Less chance. <laughs> How? Okay. I, I think maybe there are um, uh, may no question here, but I think they may uh, want to direct uh, directly di yeah. discussion with you. Okay. So. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, 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 Chinese is a bit wrong. Okay. 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 呃，再让我们掌声感谢呃 ，Carl Smith 带来的精彩演讲。Thank you so much.